All right, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'd like to discuss uh, the upcoming nurses strikes, uh, eventually anyway, against the background of an NHS now so badly underfunded that there are talks of 12-hour waits at A&E on the front page of a major newspaper today. How are the government going to play what is going to be the worst winter for the NHS ever? But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So I would say if there were any doubt as to the fact the Tories are not just incompetent, but deliberately running the NHS down in order to destroy the state funded model, you could look no further than the government defeating a House of Lords amendment to the Health and Care Bill last April. As the bill was passing through Parliament, the Lords suggested some amendments. Now, that's quite normal. One of them was to try and tackle the massive shortage of workers in the NHS. And it was to say, look, the Health Secretary should present to Parliament a report every two years to highlight the number of health and social care workers we are going to need over various periods of time, up to 20 years in the future, in order that we can plan for recruitment and training now. This would be absolutely essential information when it comes to planning for how many staff you need to train and recruit at any particular time. Absolutely essential part of making sure we don't have shortages of tens of thousands of nurses, for example, to say nothing of other staff. But the government defeated the motion. Now, 11 Conservative MPs rebelled uh, against it and, and not a single MP from any other party in England and Wales, because this covers England and Wales, voted to defeat the amendment. And the Tory MPs who voted to keep, to, to keep the amendment were not your usual rebels. There was a couple of them that sort of rebelled quite a bit. But most of them were the ones who wouldn't, they're not rebels without a cause. And you think to yourself, so why would the government object so strongly to the idea that we should have a plan for staff in the NHS? Because that's all the amendment was. All it said was the health secretary comes to parliament every two years. It's not like all the time, like taking out a load of uh, uh, resources from their department. Every two years, just to say, just to tell parliament what they should be doing anyway. Working out over the next couple of decades, you know, what are the staffing needs likely to be? So what are we going to do to make sure that those staff are in place? Why would they object to it? Because they don't want the NHS staffed. As far as they're concerned, the staff shortages we are experiencing now are not the problem. The challenge for them, as they see it, is to persuade the voting public that they are doing everything they can. You know, Health Secretary Stephen Barclay last week boasted of having increased the number of nurses in training. But that's the wrong figure to look at. Increasing the already too few in training is no good unless it's enough. You need to ask, is it enough nurses in training? And how can we tell if it's enough nurses? What could you do objectively to test that? You ask, how long at the present rate will it take to reduce the shortages down to negligible levels? That is the question to ask. How long at the current rate will it take to eliminate the shortages in practical terms? The answer is likely to be never because the shortages are actually still getting more severe. You know, there may well be more nurses in training now than in the past few years. But if there's also record numbers of nurses leaving the NHS, which there are, then even if the increased number in training was chipping away at the shortages, let us say, let us just say, it's still no good if it would take like 100 years to eliminate the shortages in practical terms. And the impacts are not going unnoticed. Several years before COVID even, they don't get to blame that. The British Medical Journey, Journal sorry, uh, ran a study and suggested that 120,000 people had died as a result of the government's austerity measures. You know, if there were to be a serious study into how many have died since as a result of continued underfunding of the NHS, general health care decisions, especially related to COVID, um, even just like cost of living. The, the, you know, health and social care out of the way, the cost of living, if people can't afford to eat healthily, that impacts their health and, and leads to, you know, this is why, for example, for the first time in history in Britain, as well as the United States, we're seeing life expectancy come down. I shudder to think what the death toll is now, in fact, all related to, to Tory policies. You know, this is the needless killing of a staggering number of people. If a dictator in some country just went out into the streets and shot this many people, there'd probably be a revolution. But the Tories get away with it because people aren't even aware it's happening. They're aware that the A&E the weights are through the roof. 
They're aware that there are a record number of people waiting for surgery. They're aware that it's very hard to get a GP appointment. But what they're not aware of is the human cost of all this. You know, it's, it's presented by the media much more like an inconvenience than a human cost. And the big news in this regard this weekend was of a five-year-old boy who died because he couldn't get hospital treatment, which would have saved his life before the Tories came along. The BBC News described the issue as down to hospital delays. Hospital delays? What's that mean? What seems to have happened, according to reports, is that the young boy was taken to, to the GP who prescribed antibiotics. His condition worsened, so then they went to A&E. The family endured a seven-hour wait, which would have been unthinkable when labour in power, and then given more antibiotics. So he continued to get worse. They went back to their GP, I think, I think according to Scania, he's back to the GP who said he needed intravenous antibiotics. It's really serious. Father contacted the hospital in Rotherham, which is not far from me, who said they didn't have the doctors or the beds to deal with it. Eventually, he was admitted to a specialist hospital in Sheffield. Too late. Died of pneumonia. The Rotherham hospital later said they don't have the paediatric care beds. Now, it doesn't really matter. He went to hospital. He should have been given hospital treatment. If they can't do it there, why didn't they ring around to a hospital that did? It's, it's that simple. And it doesn't matter whether this was an issue of a lack of beds in the boys' town or the lack of capacity in sourcing care where it is available. That's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is a young boy needed hospital care. He accessed the NHS several times, or his family did. And it doesn't matter which route to the NHS you take. Your needs are assessed and then... The care is found for you. That's how it's supposed to work. That's how it used to work. You know, that is not what happened, however, because the government has stripped away our capacity to cope. You know, what it wasn't was a case of hospital delays. It was a case of not enough capacity. It was a case of insufficient provision. You know, the NHS is badly broken and there are a number of reasons why record sums of money have been pumped into private healthcare where the NHS provision had previously existed. We're not talking about facilities that would have that weren't there. So it's like, oh, bring the private sector in to cover that while we maybe think about long-term funding. No, we're talking about provision that was in the NHS. It was there, funded, publicly funded, working. The government privatised it. That means more and more money labelled as NHS funding is going into profits. And NHS staff, just like all public sector workers, have been facing not only a reduction in general resources, which makes their job much more difficult and stressful, therefore encouraging many more to leave, but also getting real terms pay cuts. The pay demand of NHS nurses ahead of their likely strike action in England and Wales, at least, looks like it's quite high. Oh, that's high. But in reality, they'll probably settle for a bit less. I mean, that's always the case. But also, it would actually take a fairly large increase in pay to not only cope with the level of inflation this year, and going into next, but to compensate for the below inflation pay increases they've been getting since the Tories came to power. So actually, if you look at the increase needed to get themselves back up to parity with when Labour were last in power, it needs a big injection now. Now, nurses in England and Wales haven't actually voted to strike just yet. They have in Scotland. But it seems likely the strike action will be coming here as well. The question is, how will the government play it? You know, we've seen their form on strike action in other sectors. Their response is to label the striking workers as selfish, potentially tell lies about how much they earn and for good measure to blame Labour for supporting them. Then they get to blame the economic cost on the striking workers in an attempt to alleviate their own responsibility. And all of this is gamely supported by much of the popular news outlets. But it is trickier for nurses and other emergency workers. So yes, the strike action kicked off this summer. So there was quite a lot of polling of public opinion going on, as you'd expect. And what you could see, the public actually generally supports striking workers uh, right now. It's harder to try and persuade people that they're just being greedy when it's clear the cost of living is squeezing very hard. You know, that being said, it's not an overwhelming majority in support of the strike action. And majority public opinion counts for nothing in a first-past-the-post electoral system anyway. So if the Tories believe that their target voters are not on the side of the strikers, and there's every reason to suppose that's correct, then their strategy sort of works. Up to a point. I will also add, when you look at these polls by worker, you tend not to see popular support for the striking of emergency workers. So when I looked at the polls, for example, and it's talked about rail workers, 
people were generally in support. Air traffic controllers, people generally in support, and so on and so on. Nurses, people not in support because they think it harms patient care. Of course, what really harms patient care is not nurses withdrawing their labour for a few days, but tens of thousands of nurses not being in post for years on end because the government are running the NHS down. What's better, having all the nurses strike for a few days or having tens of thousands of, of nurses short all the time? But politically, the government's rhetoric against striking workers may work in their favour. That's what I'm saying. It can actually work. The, the, the voters that they are chasing can actually be made to blame the strikers. But regardless of those facts, it may play to the target voters on that regard. But, and it's a big but, we also know that people ultimately blame the government for the state of the economy. We know from polling now, and we know from a lot of election results in the past, people will only vote for a party in government that, provide, that presides over economic ruin if they are convinced that the credible alternative will be worse. So Thatcher won in the 80s, despite triggering a recession as soon as she came to power, because the public believed Michael Foote would be even worse. You know, the, the, the Bonhomme from the Falcons also boosted her. John Major did the same thing in 1992. Shouldn't have happened. Almost didn't happen, it was, but people didn't think that Kinnock would do any better. That was the problem. The change of government comes when people have no reason to suppose the opposition would be worse. So even though the Tories can make their anti-strike rhetoric work on their target voters in all probability, they are going to pay for it later on with the economic damage caused. Because right now, people are not looking at Labour and going, yeah, but well, they'd be even worse. That is not what the public are thinking. So on balance, it is still better for the Conservatives to avert these strikes with better pay offers. Now, they complain that it will further fuel inflation. You know, having people paid at or below the level of inflation is never an inflationary problem. People, these workers were getting above inflation pay increases when Labour were in power. Didn't trigger a, an inflation problem, did it? We didn't get an inflation problem, did we? So it wouldn't cause one now. The inflationary problem, because it's not a problem when we have inflation. The problem is when it's too high. And the reason why inflation is too high right now is not paying people so they can afford the cost of living. It's the cost of certain things rising much higher than it should. Now, if the government are worried about inflation, then they should prevent these unnecessary price rises. I mean, Brexit was one source of them. But, for example, excessive profits by, say, oil and gas companies or energy companies. So why don't the government tell these companies to lower their prices back down to reasonable levels or to have their excess profits taken in the form of a new tax? Never mind a windfall tax. Could be called the piss takers tax or something. But no, let the wealthy profiteer and let the nurses go cold and hungry. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.